Well, I'm engaged in a series of videos with my good friend Nathan Jacobs in the Hank Unplugged podcast, uh, which is dealing with stumbling blocks between orthodoxy and evangelicalism. So many people looking at Eastern Orthodoxy or the ancient church look at the ancient church through a particular prism, uh, through a particular lens. And many of these people are very zealous about truth. In the introduction video that I did, uh, which precedes this video, I talked about a friend who I'd played golf with for a long time who was concerned that I might be worshiping idols because of the fact that within Eastern Orthodoxy, there is a great emphasis that is placed on icons. And... I want to read something that I wrote in my book, uh, Truth Matters, Life Matters More. Uh, I'm talking here about the seven ecumenical councils, the seventh of which was the Council of Nicaea uh, in 787. It was Nicaea, not one in 325, but Nicaea two. And here's what I wrote. I, I, I said that the Second Council of Nicaea not only exonerated iconodules, meaning venerators of icons, but afforded icons their rightful place as windows into another world, a world of Christ and the cross, a world of saints and martyrs, an iconographic world of those deified by graces dispensed within the spiritual gymnasium, which is the body of Christ. As with other heresies condemned by the councils, the iconoclastic heresy exposed a false Christology. And I think we really want to camp out on that. A false Christology. Why? Because the invisible word who took on flesh also sanctified visible realities, iconographic images of the faith once for all delivered to the saints. Now, you've done a far more significant work on icons in a paper for uh, the Christian Research Journal that is titled John of Damascus and His Defense of Icons. I want you to talk a little bit about John of Damascus, uh, who he is. A lot of people may not be familiar with John of Damascus. And why was it necessary to defend icons? What is the significance of icons? And, and maybe in the discussion we can go so far as perhaps to make the analogy that if someone was reading Dante's Inferno today, they might read it in a wooden literalistic fashion and fail to see that there's a tapestry, a rich tapestry of meaning that's inculcated uh, in, in this piece, in, in this great uh, what, what, what's often referred to as a divine comedy, not in the sense of comedic, but in the inverse of the sense of a tragedy, like Romeo and Juliet. So the, the same thing is true with icons. People look at icons, and oftentimes they don't see the profundity. They say, oh, kind of two-dimensional. I don't think it's particularly appealing. But there's a world there that is just waiting to be Explored. So let's talk about icons and, and, and what the Eastern Orthodox perspective is with respect to icons, which is not about worshiping an object or idolizing an object, but it has to do with the difference between worship and veneration. That's right. Yeah. So um, that's a distinction that John of Damascus, uh, who you mentioned, um, uh, that I talk about in, in that paper. Um, he is very big on that distinction, right, between uh, proskinesis and uh, latria, right, the difference between honor and worship. Uh, John of Damascus is a fascinating church father, and um, definitely in my, uh, my, you know, sort of top, top five favorite of the church fathers. I've, I've always said that uh, if I was uh, bound to pick only one, you know, work by a, a church father that I could, you know, was allowed to to hold on to. Uh, I would probably pick John of Damascus's sort of, I suppose, it's not a single work, but his trio uh, that was done in in 
uh, in defense of the Orthodox faith, where he uh, he wrote the Fount of Knowledge, which was basically this encyclopedic uh, catalog of patristic terms, right, and which is incredibly helpful, right? A church father saying, when the church fathers use this word, they mean this, right? When they use this word, they mean this. Did a catalog of heresies, right, his own heresies. And then he did an exact exposition of the Orthodox faith, right? Uh, and uh, this is a fascinating uh, work because it's essentially a systematic theology written by a church father that's supposed to be based on nothing but the consensus of the church fathers before him. And that really in, embodies what John of Damascus was all about. His concern was always to say, I want to add nothing to this work. I just want to be faithful to what's been handed down before me, right? To tradition, because that's what tradition means, to hand something down. And uh, in the same way, his defense of icons embodies that same concern. His concern is, I want to be faithful to what's been handed down. And so his, his defense of the icons is really uh, in that same spirit. And the context in which he's writing is a fascinating one, because really John of Damascus was somebody who was um, in the midst of these, you know, sort of Arab-Byzantine wars. Islam is, is making its advances um, on Byzantium. And with that, uh, there are mounting losses that start to cause uh, certain people, specifically the emperor, to wonder, I wonder, maybe, maybe we're guilty of idolatry, right? The very, the very charge that you raised, right? Maybe we're guilty of idolatry. Maybe that's why the Muslims are, are winning. You know, maybe we should rethink these practices. And that's what uh, sparked this entire iconoclast controversy. Let's go break apart the icons. You know, let's go whitewash the icons. Let's get rid of them all. Uh, and John of Damascus is writing in that context saying, I think that's a divergence from the faith. And more importantly, not only is it a divergence from what has been handed down, I think the only way to embrace that position is to uh, do so via a faulty Christology. And that's, that's really the heart of, of where he goes. Um, so in terms of John of Damascus's defense of icons, um, there are several different components to it, and I'm happy to start with, you know, whichever one you think is best. He obviously deals with the biblical case, which is the one you, ma you mentioned. He deals with this distinction between honor and worship, which is another one you mentioned. He deals with the connection between likenesses and the things they are like, and he also deals with, most importantly, um, what is accomplished in the incarnation and how that informs the Christian view of matter and holiness and creatures that participate in holiness and so on. So I'm happy to start I think wherever we start you think is best. The, the latter, I, I think uh, to say that to be an iconoclast uh, is to have a false Christology is, is, is pretty poignant language. Yeah, it is. Uh, and, and I think we ought to start, why is it that we would say that someone who is against icons may be in danger of having an inadequate view of Christ in the Incarnation? Yeah. Well, so John, this connects directly with John's treatment of the biblical texts. So John looks at uh, the, the command, right, that you're not supposed to make any graven images and bow down to them, and worship them, right, these sorts of things. Uh, and as he looks at that command, he says, yeah, he grants. On the surface, it looks like uh, that prohibits, it looks like it prohibits images. Uh, but John points out, yeah, but clearly that's a superficial reading because God goes on and commands them to make a bunch of images of things in heaven and things on earth for the tabernacle. So he says it's clearly not that. So what is it about? And thankfully, we have in Deuteronomy 4, uh, an exposition of exactly what the commandment is about. And in Deuteronomy 4, what is stated very clearly is that the reason you are not to, supposed to make a likeness of anything is because when the Lord appeared to you on Horeb, on Mount Horeb, you heard a voice, but you saw no likeness. And then it goes on and it says, you know, and lest you look around and, you know, you make for yourself a likeness of a man or something that creeps or something that flies by the air or a celestial body. Remember, you heard a voice, but you saw no likeness. In other words, the exposition of the commandment is all about the fact that your God is invisible. 
when he appeared to you, he did not appear in the likeness of any of these things. Which means that if you make a likeness and say, this is my God, that likeness will not be of your God. It will be of a man, and you will be worshiping man. It will be of a creeping thing, and you will be worshiping that. It will be of the sun, and you will be worshiping that. In other words, the real danger that the commandment prohibits is that you might worship creatures. And John says, and that's exactly what the devil has led humanity into, the worship of creation and of demons, which are, of course, creatures. Uh, and, and his concern is that, that that, at the end of the day, that is the real prohibition. It's not a prohibition on, um, on images, because God does command them to make images. Now, the question that this raises is the very question of what do you do with the incarnation, right? Something has changed. The word took on flesh and dwelt among us. And John wants to know, he says, look, I'm, I, uh, the commandment still prohibits making images of the Father. The Father has no, you know, likeness, right? He's still the invisible God. But as Paul says, God has given to us the likeness of the invisible God, which is the Son of God incarnate. Yeah, it's so flesh. beautiful the way he says that in First uh, Colossians. That's uh, one where he says, the image mm-hmm. of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. That's right. And it's the word icon, right? Yeah. That image, right? That word translated image is icon. Uh, and that's exactly John's point, is he says, look, the question is, when you look at the contrast between Deuteronomy, which says, make no likeness because you heard a voice and saw no likeness, how does that square with, say, 1 John, right? Uh, where he talks about, you know, us proclaiming what we have seen, what we've looked on, what we've touched, right? This is what we proclaim. Uh, and, and John insists that, look, the fact that the Son of God has appeared in the flesh means he does have a likeness. It is possible to make a likeness of him. And the concern is that the only way to get around that, there are only a couple of ways to get around the assertion that a likeness of Christ is a likeness of the Son of God. One way is to go the route of the Manichees, uh, a descetic route, right, where you say, well, he wasn't really incarnate, right? It was a phantasm. It was an appearance. It's not really him. But of course, clearly, that's contrary to the teachings of Scripture, that he took on flesh and dwelt among us. Uh, so John's concern is docetism, right, uh, where you, you would reject the incarnation wholesale, the alternative is that you divide Christ in two, and this is the error, the error of what uh, is called Nestorianism, right? So in the uh, Third Ecumenical Council, dealing with the Nestorian uh, heresy, uh, what you have is you have the, you have the concern uh, that with Nestorius, he really has not only two natures, right, a divine and a human nature, but he has two persons, Right. He has two subjects, and somehow, you know, these are fused together. And, and, uh, but, you know, there's the human subject, and then there's the divine subject. And so you could divide Christ in two and say, well, you know, this is only an image of his humanity, right, and not of his divinity, and that's why, you know, this is a problem. But again, uh, the Orthodox position... And but here I'm using Orthodox, not in the Eastern Orthodox Church as opposed to, right, where we sit now in history, but the Christian position, right, by the Orthodox faith at the time, John meant Christianity. The Christian position was that Christ is only one subject, right? He has two natures, but there's only one person. It's the Word that dwelt among us. The Word was the one who was crucified. The Word was the one we saw and touched, right? Uh, And that squares precisely with uh, John, the Apostle John's language uh, about the proclamation. And so John of Damascus's worry is that the really the two main routes by which somebody might say that this icon is not an icon of the Son of God are to either deny the incarnation or to divide Christ himself and isolate his humanity from his divinity as if he's two people rather than one. But both of those are contrary to the faith that was once given over to the saints. So how, how do you get from that to the, the existential experience of walking into an Orthodox church. You're an evangelical, you open the doors, <laughs> and you see that in the narthex of the church, and maybe it's important to point out that the church is divided into three substantial uh, parts. Uh, you have the narthex of the church, 
you have the nave where people gather, and then you have the uh, the sanctuary, sort of the kitchen for the priests. Right. Um, when you walk into the back of an Orthodox church, you will see people lighting candles, and you will see people venerating icons. And in that veneration, you will see them kiss the icon, you will see them bow before the icon. How is that not the worship of an icon? And what is the attraction of the icon to begin with? Two-dimensional, doesn't look all that jazzy in terms of modern art or even ancient art. And, 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 and w w what's going on with these icons? Right, I mean, right. there's something that is mysterious and, and multifaceted there, but seems obscure to the person just walking in and seeing it for the first time, walking in and seeing it for right. the first time. Well, I think there's sort of three things happening there. The one, the one is that uh, John's distinction between uh, veneration, right? proskinesis and latria, right? Between veneration or honor and worship, right? So honor is approved by scripture, approved by church tradition, but worship is not. That's exactly right. So John points out, he points to a host of biblical texts in which what you see is that the people, right, the people of God appropriately, right, without rebuke, uh, honor a, a person, right? They honor a place, Right? They honor a thing. Um, consider, for example, how the tabernacle was handled itself. Clearly, it was treated with honor, with veneration, uh, because it was not a common object. Right? These things were touched by God. Right? It's interesting that Moses, just like as as you know, Hank, uh, icons are not just you know considered icons just because they've been painted. Right? They're supposed to be blessed, and they're placed behind the altar. Right? They they are in some ways set apart as sacred. And what's interesting is in the Old Testament, you see the same practice, right? Moses anoints, he blesses the artifacts of the, the, the tabernacle, and then the glory of God descends and touches them. And um, now they are set apart as holy. They are no longer common objects, right? Because they have communed with God and have been set apart as sacred. And icons are treated in the same way. The liturgical artifacts are treated in the same way. These are not just common objects. And so John points out that um, it's appropriate to honor um, people of authority. It's appropriate to honor holy people. It's appropriate to honor places where God has appeared, right? We see that all the time in Scripture, where a place is honored because uh, God has done something there. Uh, and appropriate to honor certain objects that are, you know, for example, Aaron's rod that, you know, budded and so on. So John points to all of these examples to say honor or veneration of things that are not common or are sacred, set apart as holy, that's perfectly appropriate. But you're absolutely correct. You should never, ever, ever worship them. And it's one of the things that's interesting in, in Luke when the... Uh, when the commandment, you know, you shall, it's actually, you know, you shall honor the Lord your God and worship him alone, right? And the alone is ascribed to the latria, right? To the, the, the worship part of it, but not to the, the exclusivity is not applied to the proskinesis, to the honoring. And so, um, so John is very insistent. Worship of icons is anathema, right? That is, that is something that should never be done, and that would be idolatry if they were worshiped. Uh, but no, no Christian should ever worship an, an icon. Uh, they should treat them with some sort of reverence or honor the way you would have taught, uh, treated the tabernacle, you know, in the Old Testament with honor, because it's not just a common object, uh, but it is not worship. So that's one of the key distinctions that John makes. Um, the other thing that uh, goes on there also, though, is John's uh, insistence that there is a connection between the person, right, that this is a likeness of, and the, the likeness, right? So John points out uh, uh, that the word, you know, homo, uh, uh, homoioma, uh, likeness that keeps on showing up in Deuteronomy 4, or in the Septuagint translation of uh, Deuteronomy 4, is uh, it's, it's not idol, right? It's not idolos. It's, it's not using the word for idol. It's using the word for likeness. And that the real concern there is that you will worship the thing it is like, right? And so this is, there's this phrase that shows up in John of Damascus and then his counterpart, uh, Theodore the Studite, 
uh, that you know the honor paid to the image passes to the archetype. Uh, and here the presumption is that when you are honoring, you know, when you are paying honor to the likeness of a person, right, it is really not, you know, it is passing from that image to to the archetype. And there's two examples you could give here. Of course, the one would be something simple like, let's say you have a soldier on the field of battle, misses his wife, he pulls out her photo out of his pocket, looks at it, he kisses it. Is there any real concern that he's enamored with photo paper? You know, that doesn't seem to be at all what's present. This is all about his wife, right? This has to do with a, a display of his affection and uh, his longing to be with his wife again. And so this is, this is about the archetype, not about the image, right? Not about the material of the image. And um, in a similar way, John points out that that's exactly what the tabernacle in the Old Testament does. The Old Testament talks about, um, we, we, we find in scripture, in Hebrews, for example, that, um, that the tabernacle is a shadow, right? Of these, it is an image of, of the things that, you know, were shown to Moses. It's a shadow of the heavenly realm. It is a likeness of heavenly realities. And in this way, right, the priest stands before a likeness, for example, in the Holy of Holies, right? The Ark of the Covenant is a likeness of the heavenly throne of God. That's why there's angels on top of it that, you know, look, you know, don't look because, you know, who, who are they not looking at? They're looking at God, right? So there's no likeness of God, right? But God will meet you above the mercy seat, right? And so you have the likeness of things in heaven that won't look at God. And that's how we sort of signify that, you know, that's where God is. And by offering sacrifice before that likeness, he offers to God, you know, sacrifice to God, right? Uh, and so the interaction is actually with a likeness of a heavenly reality, and in that it's passing to the, you know, to the archetype itself, right? This is the means by which uh, he makes sacrifice to God. And John of Damascus's point is that in a similar way, what we have is we have these shadows of the saints here before us. We have these shadows of Christ that are here before us, and even though we can't see them, right, physically present in the flesh before us, what we can do is we can pay honor to them uh, by honoring their likeness, the same way that a soldier might kiss a photo of his wife who he misses because she's not physically present with him. Uh, and that's the closest approximation uh, he has. And similar, the way a priest in the tabernacle would make sacrifice to God uh, before the likeness of his heavenly throne. So that's the that's sort of the second component uh, to that that argument there. Now, as for you know what these images mean, right? Uh, you you brought up the question of sort of flat exterior and uh, whether there's a greater depth, and there certainly is. I don't know if I'm the best person to speak to the you know all the dimensions of those that depth, but. Uh, you, one of the things that you do see is that there is a very careful, um, there is a very clear intentionality to the way these icons are crafted, right? There's, there are sacramental, you know, elements used in their construction in a very intentional way. Uh, there is symbolism in the positions of their hands that would be missed, right, if you're unfamiliar with what those positions mean. Uh, there is intentionality of, you know, incorruption that comes through in the gold that's used there. Um, and so, uh, and, and then, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I would just use, let's say I'll use an example of, um, you know, uh, maybe rather than speaking in these broad terms, I'll use one example that I think is fascinating. Um, there is the icon, I'm sure you're familiar with it, of Pentecost, right? And the history of this icon is fascinating uh, because one of the things that you see is you see, okay, there are the apostles, right? And they're sitting in this sort of archway and there's this door underneath. Um, and commonly what you see is an old man holding fabric with, you know, these, you know, something on the fabric. And you go, okay, so it's Pentecost, right? What's the big deal? But there's a certain richness to what is there if you follow the history of that icon. Because first of all, one of the things that you find, 
is just like the sort of odd geometry of these icons, which is intentional. It's not that they just couldn't figure out perspective or something <laughs> like that. It has to do with this sort of, you know, it, it, it deals in both the sort of warped nature of our current reality, but also the sort of timeless realities that they're dealing with, right? It's not supposed to be a simple, you know, uh, realist rendition of these things. Uh, but you see that come through also in the fact that Paul is present, right, in the Pentecost. Why on earth is Paul present? Paul wasn't present at Pentecost, right? Am I forgetting my Bible? I mean, was Paul present at <laughs> Pentecost? Um, and so already there it signals this is not about that moment in time, right? And then you would say, well, who's the old man, you know, in the doorways? You start to realize, oh, that archway and those doors represent the doors of the church, Right, and the old man there is oftentimes labeled, if you read it, right, the cosmos, right, the cosmos being at that in that doorway. But in older icons, when you look at the history of this, one of the things that's fascinating is that in certain times in church history, those doors are shut, and they're shut because those icons were done during a certain time of persecution, as you know, in the liturgy, right before they perform, you know, the the Eucharistic moment, the doors, the doors. And the history of that declaration, the doors, the doors, guard the was doors. guard the doors, right? Lest they come in and defile the Eucharist, right? Uh, I mean, we need to finish this up now before uh, they come in and <laughs> and take us and and we're all martyred. Uh, and there were times in church history where uh, that icon, the doors are shut, right, because of the persecution that's there. But there are other times in church history where you see. Um, all the tribes and peoples of the earth there. And that has to do with both the Pentecost moment and the undoing of Babel that's there. But it also has to do with the depth and richness of, of the redemptive work of Christ. And one of my favorite uh, oddities in the history of that icon is actually that uh, in some of the renditions of it, there's a dog man amongst all the peoples and tribes of the earth. Uh, I mean, by dog man, I mean, you know, a humanoid that has a dog head. And in the history of iconography, if you go back to the pagan icons of the pagan images of the monsters at the far reaches of the earth, right, where there's these abominations, one of them is a dog man. Similarly, in some Jewish iconography of the flood where the Nephilim are being drowned and they're interpreted as these demonic human hybrids, they're dog men in the water. And so similarly, one of the things you see in the history of this icon is that it's not just bringing back together the people from every tribe and tongue, but it's even undoing the abominations that ought not to be, that have defiled the creation. Uh, which These are such profound statements about uh, the work of Christ and about the faith. Uh, but if you don't realize that, if you don't really understand that um, the depth of this liturgical text, which is really how they saw it, it's a liturgical text, uh, yeah, the assessment will just be a superficial assessment of, do I like the colors? Are those, how's the anatomy? You I, want, know. I, I, want, I actually want to move on uh, to the next in the video series as we tackle a lot of the objections that people raise to the historic Christian faith, uh, to orthodoxy in particular. But you, you, capture my interest in what you just said. As you were explaining what's going on in a particular icon, mm -hmm. uh, the icon that has to do with Pentecost, um, there's a whole tapestry of biblical truth that you're unfolding. And all of that is rendered in pictorial form. And I, I, I think it's worth elaborating on the fact that there was a time in which the Christians simply didn't have Bibles. I mean, mm -hmm. the Bible didn't just fall out of the sky. Right. Uh, they, they didn't have Bibles. Mm -hmm. uh, you can say that period was 10 years or 20 years or 40 years. But there was a period when people didn't have Bibles. There was a period in which even the letters that were being circulated were not available to all the churches, and certainly there was a period of time in which all of the letters as a corpus, as the New Testament, the 27 
uh, books of the Old Testament hadn't been ratified. Uh, that wasn't really done until uh, 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 Athanasius the Great in 367 and then uh, didn't become prevalent in all the churches until a long time after that. So during that period of time, there had to be a way in which the truth once for all delivered to the saints was passed on. And the church is depicted in Scripture is the ground and the pillar of truth, which is commissioned to do that very thing, to pass on these truths. And one of the ways that was done was in pictorial form through icons. Yeah. Well, John talks about that very fact. Uh, he talks about these icons as uh, texts of the illiterate. Right. Uh, and so in many ways, uh, one of the ways, one of the reasons he thinks they are due honor is not just for their, you know, role as part of the liturgical life of the church, not just because they've been blessed and set apart, but also because they are means of instructing uh, young people. They are means of instructing the illiterate. They are memorials, right? He also makes them memorials, right? In many ways, one of the things we see consistently happen in Scripture, whether it's in the, you know, you'll see textual memorials to things God has accomplished in sacred Scripture. You'll also see, obviously, the making of memorials of a certain place where God has shown up. And when John of Damascus looks at the icons and identifies what they are and what they are doing, that memorial is also part of it, right? They are memorials, they are texts, they are instruction. And with that, of course, John is also insistent, as you pointed out, um, that, that this is part of the oral tradition of the church that is handed down. Uh, and John uh, takes that very seriously because uh, when we consider the fact that, you know, Paul says, abide what, by whatever I've told you, whether by word of mouth or by epistle, uh, for us, that just comes across as one verse in a complete New Testament. But as you pointed out, for most people, especially the original hear you know, readers of that, or hearers of that, right, be being read in the church, uh, would hear that when they may only have a couple of letters, right? They, do they don't hear that in the context of we have a complete... Use the restroom. <laughs> They got it. Nathan's <laughs> son there has an urgent need to use the restroom, That's and he's right. being very, very patient. Right. Um, so, so we see that as one verse to be considered amongst a completed New Testament. But for the original readers of that, you know, they're sitting there. Maybe they've only seen a couple of letters, only heard a couple of letters. And so the oral tradition that's been passed down, the instructions they've received of what to do and how to live as Christians are as primary to them, if not more primary to them, than the written text that they have. Because in some ways, those may outweigh quantitatively you know, apostolic instruction, they may have more oral instruction from the apostles than written. And John of Damascus realizes, of course, that becomes uh, a bit of a, a, a tabula rasa into which you could hypothetically push any number of things. And that's, but that's what exactly why one of the things that John of Damascus regularly does is at the end of each of the three treatises he writes, right, or three orations that he writes in defense of the icons, he catalogs uh, writings from the church fathers to demonstrate, look, I'm not just saying that there was an oral tradition where this practice was done and has been done from the start. I will show you the texts in which the church fathers themselves consistently embody this as part of the practice of the faith that was handed down. Uh, and in, in, so that's where what we see there is with John this continuity, and that continuity uh, has to do with that faith once given over to the saints. One of the things that uh, struck me as you were speaking is that there was a certain sense of illiteracy uh, because people were either illiterate or they didn't have uh, the texts to go by. Uh, and so the icons became ever more poignant and profound in that epoch of time. But it seems to me that the same thing is true today. And uh, we want to move on, but let me cash this out quickly and have you comment. When I was in the hospital this summer, not all that long ago, uh, I had a wall of icons set up in my hospital room, and one of the primary icons is an icon that is delineated as the two faces of Christ. 
uh, that Christ is one person with two natures, 100% human, 100% divine. And people would come into my hospital room and some of them would say, wow, this is a holy place. But I was absolutely fascinated by the interest people showed in those icons. And quite frankly, I had the opportunity to be a witness for Christ over and over again as people came into the hospital room. People that were visiting me, doctors, nurses, workers, cleaners. I mean, they would look at those icons and I'd start to explain some of the nuances that you have so masterfully explained to those people in my hospital room. And as a result of that, there were all kinds of people deeply impacted by the faith once for all delivered to the saints. My point, I guess, Nathan, is that perhaps today the icons have an exaggerated profundity because people by and large have become biblically literate once again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I will, I will say that one of the things I talked about in, in the film Becoming Truly Human was uh, just how befuddled I was during my spiritual journey by uh, sacred images. And one of the things uh, that was so perplexing to me was that I was drawn to them uh, and but there wasn't if you know if I'm really honest with my memory of of what that allurement was right it wasn't me being drawn to the images just because of a technical proficiency right I I was drawn to Michelangelo because he was incredible at anatomy but that was not the same type of draw that I I had to other types of religious spaces and artifacts and part of what I was drawn to there uh, in icons or what I found intriguing uh, and, and, and fascinating about other sort of, even, you know, Egyptian wing of a museum or something like that, was it seemed that there was a transcendent reality that was somehow made imminent in these things. It was clear to me, um, you know, that, that say, you know, that uh, artifacts from Egypt were not just carvings, right? These were conduits for something. And, uh, and in some ways that, that would oftentimes be disturbing if you get a vibe that you think, I don't, whatever this is a conduit for, I don't want to have much to do with. And it's, sometimes it was alluring, right? Such as in iconography. Uh, but I had no framework for processing that. But one of the things that I think uh, I've, I've noticed in many of the nuns, to circle back to the Becoming Truly Human film and, and the conversation we had in a, in a previous segment about the nuns, uh, many of the nuns intuit the same thing. They're drawn to sacred spaces and sacred imagery, and they find that in some way intriguing. That speaks to some aspect of their spiritual intuitions that they're drawn to. And I think here you see two things that come out and I'll try to make this as brief as possible. But one, one thing that comes out is the opportunity for them to instruct, which is exactly what John has talked about and exactly what, you know, you just talked about. These texts of the illiterate, and as you said, right, there's growing biblical illiteracy. So, um, so there's real opportunity for the icons to do work, right, on behalf of, of those who don't know these stories or don't know these truths or whatever it may be. Um, but the other thing is this concept that John talks about that I think is important um, is one aspect of his argument that I haven't talked about is the fact that when Christ joined himself to humanity and was incarnate in the flesh, uh, he didn't just take on our flesh, he metamorphosized it, right? We see in the transfiguration uh, his flesh you know, glows with divine energy in the resurrection. He puts off corruption for incorruption. And one of the things that John points out is that that divine life uh, that Christ brings into our species and joins with us, uh, it doesn't just stop at his flesh, right? Even his garments become conduits for this sort of thing. And while that may seem like a foreign concept, there's certainly biblical precedent for the idea that you don't just have prophets or angels or apostles serving as conduits for divine life uh, and, you know, what the Eastern Orthodox would call energies, right? Uh, but you also see objects, 
being conduits uh, for God's operative powers, right? Objects participate, Aaron's bud, the, you know, Aaron's rod that budded I mentioned is one of them. Uh, but we also see this sort of thing happen where even, you know, the apostles touch handkerchiefs and then they're brought to the sick and, you know, those things are used to heal or somebody touching Christ's robes and then being used to heal. In other words, one of the things that John Ascus points out is that the redemptive work of Christ and the bringing together the life of God into our world doesn't just stop at a spiritual reality. It extends to the material reality. It extends to our flesh and even beyond. And the material world is caught up in this participation of God. And so when John talks about things that are set apart as holy, right, places that have become holy, um, people who have become holy, right, saints, that's what the word means, right, the holy ones, uh, or even objects that have been set apart as holy, one of the things that he is pointing out is this more profound reality that holiness is something that is unique to God and something becomes holy because it communes with God. And in some ways, to put it crudely, God rubs off on them, right? Uh, and that's where, when John talks about the tabernacle being set apart as holy, right, because Moses blessed it and then God touched it, that there is a similar reality that is believed about the icons and the liturgical life of the church. This place has been set apart and blessed and touched by God and made holy, and that's why we don't treat it as common things. Because just like us who have been given the privilege of communing with God and being made a holy people, so even the place of worship and the instruments of worship have been touched by God and made holy by communion with him. Beautiful. Uh, so much more could be said. I mean, we spent hours and hours on this, and, and, and maybe to some degree our discussion will stimulate people to take a, an even deeper dive uh, with respect to icons. There's a whole history, and as I pointed out at the very beginning, you see that history uh, come to a climax in Nicaea 2, 787. Uh, so this was dealt with historically in the councils of the church in collegial fashion. I want to, in the next video, uh, talk about something that uh, gives us a template for looking at many of the stumbling blocks that come up. Faith versus works, sola fide, etc. Uh, this was precipitated in my mind, actually, by an article that my son David uh, posted uh, and I read the article and I thought, wow, this is my oldest son, David. I thought, wow, this is really an interesting article. I bet you a lot of people would be interested in reading this article. So we posted it on the web at equip.org. It's still up there. And, and then people started uh, posting it all over the place. Uh, magazines posted it. And that article became uh, the subject of a lot of controversy. Uh, the article's titled, Does the Bible Answer Man's Son Believe That He Has Left the Christian Faith? And I, I tell you, my son David did a terrific job writing this article. But people have responded, as I said, to the article. And one of those responses comes from a well-known evangelical group that has a tremendous zeal for, uh, for reaching the lost, uh, for uh, abiding by the essentials of the historic Christian faith. And so they went through that article and they pointed out a lot of things that from their perspective makes it abundantly clear that Hank Hanegraaff has left the Christian faith. We'll talk about that in the next Hank Unplugged podcast in this series on stumbling blocks that people perceive within Eastern Orthodoxy.